So this week, my mom shared with me a story that was fascinating to me. As I did a little bit of research, I found this on Twitter, posted by Mark Miller. I just want you to listen as I read through it, because I think the way that he puts it is captivating. A 92-year-old nun died today in a Carmelite monastery in Illinois. She was kind of an unusual nun. She didn't sing very well. She was frequently late to her required duties around the convent. She threw sticks for the communal dogs, which was not allowed. Also, she was my mother. I've only seen her twice in the last 33 years since she joined the convent, partly because the Carmelites are a contemplative order. They don't teach school or work in hospitals, or even leave the building in which they live. They pray. They live in silence 23 and a half hours of the day. When you go to visit, you can't get a hug or touch. You are separated by an offset pair of double metal grills. He's only seen her twice in the past 33 years. I am not the only child of the nun, not even close. I am the ninth of her children. She has 28 grandchildren, some of whom she has never seen. 28 grandchildren, some of whom she has never seen. She has more than a dozen great-grandchildren as well, none of whom she has held. Below are the ten of us in age order from right to left. You might have guessed that she has not always been a nun, She grew up in San Francisco and Oregon and went to school in California and New York. She had a boyfriend. She got married at the age of 20. By age 27, she had five kids, and then she had five more, a basketball team of each gender. Planned Parenthood, she called it. She had a million and one friends. She smoked. She drank. She played cards. She was pregnant for more than 400 weeks of her life. It's a long time to be pregnant. She became an open water diver. She drove so fast and recklessly that people got out of her car with a sore foot from slamming on the imaginary brake. She gave up smoking, alcohol, and caffeine on the same day and somehow managed not to commit homicide as a result. Her husband died in 1984. Five years later, she gave away everything she owned in the world. On her 61st birthday, she had a farewell party with 800 guests at a San Francisco hotel and flew to Chicago the next day. And giving away everything she had was a lot, by the way. Um, One of her, she was heirs of the PG&E estate and another massive thing in in, uh, San Francisco. Uh, They compared her to her and her husband to the Rockefellers in San Francisco. She was known as a socialite. She was of the upper elite class in San Francisco. She entered the monastery in De Plains, Illinois, home of the first McDonald's. She preferred Dairy Queen. So that's where she has been hanging out for the last 33 years, making rosary, rosary beads out of flower petals and sleeping in her own cell. Oh, and chilling with a succession of German Shepherd dogs that live there too. She never let it, us have any pets growing up, so karma is greater than dogma. I'm not here for the sorry for your lost thirstiness. Our relationship was complicated. I'm not mourning. And then he puts the dates that Ann Russell Miller lived from 1928 to 2021. What drives a woman like this, Ann Miller, to become a nun? To leave her family behind, 28 grandkids, 12 great-grandkids that she has never held. Never to get to hold or touch or be close to her family for the last 33 years of her life. I invite you to turn with me to Daniel again, Daniel chapter 8. Last week we looked at the the sanctuary language that is in Daniel chapter 8, and we noted that the sanctuary is all about what? Why did God want a sanctuary as a model here on earth? That he might dwell among us. He wants to be with you. That's good news. 
at least to me, it's good news. God wants to be with us. Well, verse 10, we're going to pick it up here because we saw the sanctuary picture, a ram and a goat remind us of the sanctuary, even though they're talking about the Medes and the Persians and Greece and then moving into the empire of Rome. And then from the empire of Rome, we get to the holy Roman empire, which is now ruled by a religious figure, the bishop of Rome. Verse 10 says, And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host. We see later in verse 24 that this is God's people. And some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. People that are earnestly wanting to follow God are somehow being trodden underfoot. They're being trampled. People that genuinely want to know God. Verse 11 continues. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. We talked about briefly how this term for prince of the host is what is used for the the divine being that Joshua meets before the battle of Jericho, who is referred to as Yahweh himself, but first is referred to as the commander of the host. And now this is where we're going to focus in today. And by him, the daily were taken away. Last week we focused in on, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. We looked at how the sanctuary became a misrepresentation and a barrier, actually, of people getting to God. The churches on the the planet in the dark ages became the place where it was difficult to get to God. But today we're going to focus on this. And by him, the daily were taken away. In the context of the sanctuary, what is this daily? You notice that your Bible may have sacrifices there. I've intentionally taken that out because that actually is not there in the Hebrew. That is there understood by some translators because this term is tamid in the Hebrew. It's tamid, which is translated either daily or continual. And in the context of the sanctuary, we're going to go through this real fast, but, but pay attention. In the context of the century, in sanctuary, we find this use of tamid with specific elements in the sanctuary service. First, we find it with the sacrifices. This is why translators sometimes put daily sacrifices there. So you come into the sanctuary, and there are sacrifices that are continual burnt offering. Numbers 30, 28 to verses 3 and 6, you find that. The idea was that there was always to be a service of sacrifice. Day in and day out, there was the morning and evening sacrifice. There was a continual offering that was to be put onto this altar. So that's the first thing that we find when we come into the sanctuary. Then there's the showbread. The continual bread, actually, is the the wording in Numbers 4, verse 7. Some translations uh, put it as as showbread, but the idea is, again, tamid bread. The bread that is continually there, that is perpetually on that table. And then the next thing we find in the sanctuary is the lampstand was described as burning continually in Exodus 27, verse 20. There was always, the candle was always to be burning. The the seven-branch candlestick, the candelabra, was always to be burning in the holy place of the sanctuary. And then there's the incense. Exodus 30, verses 7 to 8, the perpetual incense that, that went up, and it was actually, the incense was almost considered a part of the most holy place because it the incense would waft into the most holy place. These are are pictures of of items in the sanctuary and services in the sanctuary that are described as, with the same word for daily or continual, uh, perpetual is another translation for it. Making sense so far? Okay, so here you have Daniel saying that, that the place of his sanctuary is cast down. And we saw that the place being the foundation, uh, like we find in the Psalms, of righteousness and justice. But this is saying that the daily was taken away. How in what sense during this same time period, we've been given the time period in Daniel chapter 7 of 1260 years from 538 to 1798 A.D., How in this time period were these things taken away from the heavenly sanctuary? Remember we learned in in Hebrews 8, 1, that Christ is a minister not here in an earthly sanctuary, but where is his sanctuary now? It's up in heaven. There's a a sanctuary up in heaven. And, And so typologically, these give us a picture of what Christ does, uh, what he did for us in the sacrifice on the cross in the outer court or in the court of the sanctuary. And then going in, you have the table of showbread. 
what did Jesus tell his disciples? I am the bread of life. And he said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He says, these are they which testify of me. This book is about me. Eat this book. Recognize the power of the word. And we looked just a few weeks ago at how truth was cast down by the same power. The Bible was censored by us as Christianity in the dark ages. Um, So then how about the lampstand? What does Jesus say? I am the light of the world. The the presence of the Holy Spirit that comes to us and then makes us the light of the world, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17, when men see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. How about the incense? Incense in the Bible, we find it represents Christ's righteousness. That, That fragrance, that beautiful fragrance represented Christ's holiness, his righteousness, the way that he lived a perfectly loving life. So, In what sense were these things taken away? Well, notice what Richard Davidson, A Song for the Sanctuary, page 704 says. He says, all those aspects of the daily ministration of the priests in the earthly sanctuary, which typologically pointed to Jesus' high priestly work in the heavenly sanctuary, the papal system applied to the pope and the papal priesthood. So let's look at this. The Pope is known actually as the Vicar of Christ. You can look at this being the, the representative or the, the, uh, it, the person uh, that is, is to, to represent him on earth, uh, according to, to, to the Christianity. <laughs> this began in the Dark Ages again. So with sacrifices, you find that when a priest goes to have the Mass service, what takes place with the bread and the grape juice? It said that he actually creates Christ, that the bread becomes the actual body of Christ, the actual blood of Christ. It's a, it's a symbol that's an important symbol, communion service. Jesus said to celebrate this, to do this in remembrance of me, to think about me. But this turned into something that has even controlled kings in history. Because you think about it, you're a king ruling in the dark ages and you believe in heaven and hell. And the Pope says to you, or a priest says to you, you better do what I say or I'm going to excommunicate you. And you cannot have the body and blood of Christ anymore. And you're terrified of being tortured unendingly for eternal ages. And you say, okay, okay, my army is yours. I will do what you say. And suddenly, the church grasped for power by taking a symbol that was to point us to Jesus and putting it down here on earth. Sacrifices. How about the showbread? Again, you have the Eucharist, and you also have how the Bible was censored. Truth was taken away so that what Christ was doing for us in revealing truth through the Bible was taken away in our Christian history. You have the lampstand. What takes place when you go to a service? Well, they began to to pray to images. They began to, to pray to saints. And part of that prayer service was to light a candle, to actually burn a candle as a sign of your prayer. Now, if you think about it, this is a fine symbol. Sure, this is, this is great. But if it becomes that the symbol is what I am looking for and what I think accomplishes what I need, I'm distracted from Jesus, the light of the world. I'm distracted from what really matters, and that is Jesus. You see, symbols can be helpful. Traditions can be helpful. They can guide us. But when they lead us to forget Jesus, no matter the symbols, we can't just point the finger at the dark ages. We can't just point the finger at any particular church because if you look at what took place with the Jewish nation, what symbol led them to want to crucify Jesus? Was it the seventh-day Sabbath that they kept getting upset at him about? (laughs) Is the seventh-day Sabbath an important symbol that reminds us of Jesus as our creator and our savior? It is a vitally important symbol, but when it is placed in the wrong position, as they did, and it is used to actually hurt people rather than help people, it can result in Jesus being lost sight of. And then there's the incense, and Priests actually offer incense, uh, it would actually offer incense in the services, which, again, it distracts from the reality 
of what Jesus is wanting to do in my heart and your heart. Now I can just come to church and I can go through the motions and and just so long as I have, have done the right things, eaten the right things, said the right prayers, I can go on about my life. And there became this separation between the spiritual and the secular. And that is easy for us to do too. I went to church, and this is how I behave at church, and this is the way church is, and, and now this is my, the other part of my life. But that's not what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus wants for his fragrance, his incense, to per- penetrate every detail of our life. The Great Controversy, page 73, highlights the crucial problem here, and that is this. Reliance upon human merit. What humans can do in approaching to God intercepts the view of Christ's infinite love. You see, now it's you're coming to church, and and if I do these things, God will love me. Rather than the fact that Jesus laid down his life because he loves me. He's doing all this in heaven because he loves me. He's provided his Bible because he loves me. Instead, I'm lighting a candle hoping that he'll love me if I pray to the right saint who has lived a righteous enough life. Reliance upon human merit intercepts the view of Christ's infinite love. You know the reality is that Romanism is the religion of human nature. It's what we naturally default to, is what I can do, what I can accomplish. It's the religion of self, which originated, as we've looked at, with Lucifer in heaven. The great controversy goes on to say this, the teachings of popes and priests had led men to look upon the character of God and even of Christ as stern, gloomy, and forbidding. What's your picture of what God is like? What's your picture of what the Father is like? Is it stern? Is it gloomy? Is it forbidding? Or is it a father who has his arms open wide to you? The Savior was represented as so far devoid of sympathy with man in his fallen state that the mediation of priests and saints must be invoked. Mediation meaning somebody can stand in between us because God's angry at me. And so I better watch out and I better find somebody that can get him on my side. But the reality is that we have a mediator who is God himself, Jesus, in human flesh, who is on our side, as is the entire Trinity. It's a council of peace in our behalf. This picture leads to dangerous actions in our lives. I want to tell you a story about a young university student who was on his way back to school. As he was walking back to school, suddenly there was a lightning bolt that struck he was living in, I believe this is 15, uh, don't quote me, 15, this was in the 1500s. And as the lightning bolt struck, he feared for his life and he cried out, St. Anne, help me, I will become a monk. He was on his way back to law school. His father had worked incredibly hard to get him into law school, working in a mine. Remember, we've talked about him. His name was Martin Luther, his father's patron saint who they believed had helped them to be successful in the mining business was St. Anne. And when he is in the midst of fearing for his life, he cries out in fear, St. Anne, help me. I will become a monk. Roland Banton, in his book, Here I Stand, a fascinating book on the life of Martin Luther, says this. In that single flash, he saw the denouement of the drama of existence. There was God, the all-terrible. Christ was inexorable. And all the leering fiends springing from their lurking places in pond and wood that with sardonic cachinations, they might seize his shock of curly hair and bolt him into hell. This isn't just fancy writing, but this is the way that they talked about the reality of who God was and how quick it was that demons could come and take your soul into hell and begin torturing you for unending ages. A picture that is not in the Bible. It was no wonder that he cried out to his father's saint, patroness of minors, Saint Anne, help me, I will become a monk. The great controversy points out the history that led Martin Luther to this, the experience that he had growing up, his picture of God, really. The, the, the problem we're dealing with here is, is what does God look like to us? And this can happen in any church, in any denomination, in any religion in the world. My picture of God impacts how I live. 
The gloomy, superstitious ideas of religion then prevailing filled him with fear. He would lie down at night with a sorrowful heart, looking forward with trembling to the dark future in constant terror at the thought of God as stern, as a stern, unrelenting judge, a cruel tyrant rather than a kind heavenly father. (laughs) Have you seen God as a kind heavenly father (laughs) who wants to be with you? This is what was taken away from God's people. They were trampled underfoot in the dark ages because they were taught lies about who God is and what his character is like. The beautiful thing is who God actually is and what our high priest is actually like. Notice Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, since the children have flesh and blood. There was this idea that, that the physical is evil and the spiritual is good. Since the children have flesh and blood, they're physical. He too, God himself, shared in their humanity. So that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. Through his death, he wanted to destroy Satan who has the power of death. Notice why he wanted to do that. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Friends, if you're here in church because you're afraid to die and you want heaven rather than hell, it's a good starting place. But don't stop there. Don't serve God based upon fear of punishment or hope of reward. It doesn't work in a marriage. <laughs> Trust me. I mean, I didn't try it, but I, I, I wouldn't try it. I mean, if I, we talked about it in an early service today. If I told Leah, okay, look, if you... Marry me, I'll give you cars, I'll give you houses. I can't do this with pastor, but anyway, I will, I will do everything. Po- so I'll give you a wonderful life. But if you don't, I'm going to tie you up and put you on a deserted island where you have to spend the rest of your life suffering. Do you think she'll love me? She might live with me because she likes cars and houses. And you and I might come to church, we might read our Bibles because we like golden streets and we like the idea of eternal life. But do we like God himself? (laughs) Do we love God for who he is? Do we know that he's a kind, heavenly father? The Great Controversy, page 123, says this, an earnest desire to be free from sin and to find peace with God. This, this, This feeling that I don't have peace with God. Romans 5 tells us, where did peace come from? It was through Christ laying down his life for his enemies that we are reconciled and we have peace with God. How much action did you or I have in the cross? Zero. Nothing. It happened 2,000 years ago. We can add nothing to it. Jesus accomplished this for us. An earnest desire to be free from sin and to find peace with God led him at last to enter a cloister and devote himself to a monastic life. Martin Luther pursued the same path that Ann Miller did. He went to the cloister and he began to earnestly pursue monkhood. He began to wake up when the bell rung and begin to, to pray with, to sing with the choir. His days were filled with singing for the choir and doing the chores around the convent and going to beg for food because they were a poor convent. Everything spiritual. At least this is the way they looked at it, in order that he wouldn't have to experience the horrors of hell and that he would spend less time in purgatory. Well, this didn't work out very well. As you can tell, it wouldn't work out very well for any human being to be focused on escaping God's judgment, to be focused on God as a stern judge. And he entered into a state of despair and depression. He was really, really struggling. I mean, this took place more once he entered into the role of priest um, he, when he took on the role of priest and did his first, first communion. Um, but, but Great Controversy pictures what the life of a monk was like and a, a nun was like in the Dark Ages. Notice what it says. For her adherence, this is the, church, uh, the, the Christian church in the Dark Ages, the Roman church, she had the discipline of the scourge, of famishing hunger, of bodily austerities in every conceivable heart-sickening form. Was your heart sickened to hear the story of Ann Miller? (laughs) Know that she missed 33 years with her kids, her grandkids, her great-grandkids. Because she, as she said in her own words, I I lived two-thirds of my life for myself. And now I'm going to live it for God. 
And so she couldn't only see her family through uh, uh, bars. She couldn't actually get to see them. It's heart sickening to see what took place in convents. To secure the favor of heaven, penitents violated the laws of God by violating the laws of nature. We'll look at how Luther, maybe next week, we'll look at how Luther actually said he fasted to the point nearly of death and he was, uh, suffered the results of that throughout his life. They were taught to sunder the ties which he has formed to bless and gladden man's earthly sojourn. (laughs) You know, the the, the ties of marriage, the, the ties of family, the ties of, of society and, and of being able to mingle with people cut off the things that God had desired to bless humanity with. Supposedly so that people could enter into a higher spiritual estate. The churchyard contains millions of victims who spent their lives in vain endeavors to subdue their natural affections, to repress as offensive to God every thought and feeling of sympathy with their fellow creatures. It's the opposite of what Jesus is like, the one whose heart is moved with sympathy and compassion for all of humanity, so much so that he became a human being. If the Bible is read, the mercy and love of God will be revealed. That's what this book is all about. I don't know if you've dug into it for yourself, but this book is about the mercy and love of God. It will be seen that he lays upon men none of these heavy burdens. Can you say hallelujah? (laughs) All that he asks is a broken and contrite heart, a humble, obedient spirit. Isaiah says exactly that. I dwell in a high and lofty place and also with him that has a contrite spirit. Christ gives no example in his life for men and women to shut themselves in monasteries in order to become fitted for heaven. He has never taught that love and sympathy must be repressed. The Savior's heart overflowed with love. The nearer man approaches to moral perfection. You want to know what moral perfection looks like? The keener are his sensibilities, the more acute his perception of sin, and the deeper his sympathy for the afflicted. I can get excited about that. I don't know about you. I want a deeper sympathy for those that are suffering. I want a deeper sympathy for those that are in need. I want keener sensibilities. I want to be able to recognize sin for what it is and to run to Jesus who loves me so much. Well, Martin Luther began to really struggle with this. As he went to do his first uh, mass service, he, when he went to say the prayer, um, it was really too much for him to take. I don't think I have that with me today. Well, anyway, he, to think that he was talking with Almighty God and to say that this bread and this grape juice, would, the wine, would become the body and blood of Christ, he barely managed to get through it. But his father had come, who they had been separated because of him joining the monastery. His father was upset that here he is neglecting his family Uh, to join the monastery, but he decided to come and support him at the first mass, because this was traditional, what fathers would do. Well, afterwards, he goes, and and he tries to talk with his father, and he says something about how he had performed the mass, and something about serving God, and how God had called him with that lightning strike. And his father stood up from the table. Is that what God calls you to do, to neglect your father and mother? How do you know that it was God and not Satan who caused that lightning strike? And he left angry. And this began to trouble Martin Luther. He began to question, what's going on here? What is God truly like? And his stern picture of God, his his picture of God as a judge that wanted to condemn him, led him to uh, self-abnegation that we talked about was, was was painful to him, hurtful to him, but also into a deep valley of despair and depression. But that all changed when God brought a friend into his life, a a father-like figure for him, Staupitz. Now, the great controversy records it like this, page 123. The pious Staupitz opened the word of God to Luther's mind and bade him look away from... Luther... Stop looking at you. Stop focusing in on your sin. Stop focusing on you. 
bade him to look away from self, cease the contemplation of infinite punishment for the violation of God's law. Stop thinking about God as coming to punish you. And look to Jesus, his sin-pardoning Savior. And then this is actually what he said, quoting from Diabne, History of the Great Reformation. Instead of torturing yourself on account of your sins, throw yourselves into the Redeemer's arms. Trust in him, in the righteousness of his life, in the atonement of his death. Listen to the Son of God. He became man to give you the assurance of divine favor. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't have been born in Bethlehem. He wouldn't have gone to the cross. He's on your side. God is your judge in a good way. And then he said this, love him who first loved you. And this set Martin Luther free. He began to realize who God really is. You see, the key question is, what do I see God as looking like? I can have the right facts in order from the Bible, but if in the end I do not recognize the fact of his mercy and love for me, then I can be in as dark of a situation as Martin Luther was. Now notice how Hebrews goes on. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers. He took on human flesh, like Stalpitz pointed out to to Martin Luther, in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. This is not the picture of what priests became here on earth, but God is a merciful high priest who comes close to humanity. He's not saying, I am disconnected from you, but I'm going to take on human flesh. I'm not afraid of your mess. I'm coming close to you. Chapter 4, verse 14 says it this way. Seeing then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot, what is that word? Sympathize with us. We have, we have a God who has sympathy for what we're going through who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but he was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. So he's able to help us in our temptations. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. You get that? Let us come boldly where? To the throne room of the universe that's called the throne of grace. The church is not the reservoir of grace. I like that you come to church. But you cannot get the grace of God in, from me. You get to open your heart to the king of the universe. He loves you. He's crazy about you. He laid down his life for you so that you could have eternal life. That, that motivates me to want to open my heart. That motivates me to want to pray all day long. To want to pray no matter what I'm doing. And I don't have to enter a convent and punish myself in order to experience that. Coming to him as, well, so, okay, Martin Luther, as he grappled with this, as he, we talked about last week, the the 95 Thesis, he eventually does something really radical. He begins to recognize that the way they thought society operated, they thought that the real and important thing was what the priests and the Pope did. The spiritual realm of the monks and the nuns, that's what really mattered. The secular world, the carpenter, the farmer, the fisherman, those people out there, that that really didn't matter. The secular was evil. And you see this taking place in the time of Jesus. You remember how they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, you didn't wash your hands right before before you ate. And he says, why do you take the traditions of men to the neglect of the commandments of God? Because you tell somebody, what did he go on to say? You tell somebody that they can say, all of my wealth is Corban, it's dedicated to God, and you can neglect your father and mother. You can basically enter a convent, it was what it later became, and you neglect your father and mother, which God has commanded in the Ten Commandments. Jesus goes on to say time and time again, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I want for your vertical relationship to result in horizontal blessing, that your sympathy towards humanity, your compassion towards your neighbor, towards your wife, towards your kids, towards your boss, will begin to open up, and I can know that I'm coming in contact with Jesus when that takes place. But if I'm hardening, if I'm angry at what people are doing around me, if I'm 
and, and I'm speaking to myself. I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. <laughs> I need Jesus. I don't need somebody to confess to. Funny story. We were having a, a parking lot sale for the school a number of years back. And I was standing there in the parking lot. And a lady comes up. And she's talking with Malin. And as she's talking with Malin, he says, oh, yeah, this is our pastor. And she looks at me. And she's like, I couldn't confess my sins to you. You're too young. And I said, great, confess them to Jesus. I don't want to know. I mean, if I can help, sure, but go to Jesus. You can open your heart to Jesus. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, Peter writes, but chosen by God and precious. You see, Martin Luther began to grapple with various texts in the Bible. And as he began to grapple with the reality of what Peter describes here, um, he realized something that, that changed the world. The, the Protestant world, if you haven't noticed, is far different from the areas of the world that did not embrace the Protestant Reformation. It changed absolutely every part of the way that we as human beings live, especially in places like the United States of America. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but precious by God and, but chosen by God and precious. Martin Luther points to this in an important letter. He says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. You and I are a part of this spiritual building so that people can come to church at our workplace because they come in contact with the sanctuary as Jesus lives in you. Then notice this, a holy priesthood. Did you know that there are priests on earth that God recognizes? You are a priesthood. (laughs) You're looking at me with a little bit of blank stares, but a holy priesthood. You, as you accept Jesus, he calls you to become a priest, a royal priesthood. This, This is the true priesthood that Christ came to do in representing what the Father is actually like. And as you come into contact with people, Martin Luther began to say, no, you know what? Your work as a farmer, your work as a cobbler, your work making shoes, your work as a dentist, your work as a doctor, your work as a lawyer, your work as a, as a house cleaner, your work as a farmer, whatever you're doing, you're to represent God in that place so that through you, people see what he's like. You are a mediator between lost humanity and God. A holy priesthood to offer up, notice, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What are these spiritual sacrifices? You and I are to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Let's look a little bit more. Verse 9, it says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. There it is again. A holy nation, his own special people. The King James Version calls it peculiar people. You are to be different, completely different and distinct From those who live self-centered lives. But notice, distinct is a far different word from distant. It does not mean to separate yourself from people. It means to be different in the way that you love them and actually draw closer to them than those who are living a selfish life. A holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You're called to be a priest who tells the world through your actions and through your words how you have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you recognize a God of infinite love who's on your side, who is not a stern judge, but who is your loving Father in heaven. It's an incredibly beautiful picture that we get to display to the world. Now, he does go on to say in verse 11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And we might point to that and say, See, I wish I could live in a convent. I wish you could lock me up in a room. I wish I could get a house far enough in the country that I didn't have to be around all these evil people that are close by. But notice... How Peter unpacks what it looks like to be a pilgrim. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles with these 
heathen people, these pagans that are around you. Have your conduct honorable among them, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Live among people in such a way that they say, is that what God is like? He's that merciful? He's that loving? Okay, I want to know more about your God. This royal priesthood is unpacked in the book of Peter. Notice how practical he gets. He says, to the Gentiles, your conduct should be honorable. But then he says, to the governing authorities, submit to the king, submit to the governor, submit to all of the governing authorities. Then he goes on to say, in your work, he talks about servant and master, you should treat them in such a way and work in such a way that they see God and you're offering a spiritual sacrifice even in your work. In your marriage, he goes on to describe what a husband should live like, what a a wife should look like, to describe that you are a priest to your wife, to your husband. At your work, with the government, how you treat them reflects upon God's character because we claim to be Christ followers. To even your persecutors or enemies. He was writing to a church that was going to endure a whole lot of persecution. And to the young and to the old. You're to be a royal priesthood. A priesthood of all believers. This concept radically transformed the world. And then notice how Peter wraps up his letter with a couple of key verses. He says, finally, all of you be of one mind. Have compassion for one another. Let that sympathy, let that compassion expand towards all of humanity around you. Love as brothers. Be tender hearted. Be courteous. It's so simple. And yet, I, in my experience, it's really hard. <laughs> it's something that I need, the incense of Christ, the righteousness of Christ living in me to live out. Testimonies for the Church, volume 9, page 189, says it this way. If we would humble ourselves before God and be kind and courteous and tender-hearted and pitiful, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one. You know, it can be tempting to point to, well, this specific thing isn't happening right, or that person isn't doing the right thing. But the reality is that we are told that if we were kind and pitiful, compassionate, tenderhearted, there would be hundreds more in this church building. That convicts me that I need more of Jesus. I need his character in my heart. Peter goes on to say the same thing, verse 8 of chapter 4. And above all things, have fervent love, For one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. It's a beautiful reality that Martin Luther began to write about, and he writes this letter to the German nobility in uh, Germany, and to write to them about this whole idea of a spiritual estate and a physical state, the physical state being evil and the, the spiritual state being good. And notice what he says. It is pure invention that Pope, bishops, Priests and monks are to be called the spiritual estate, while princes, lords, artisans, and farmers, the temporal estate. That's invention. You can't find it in the Word of God, he says. That is indeed a fine bit of lying and hypocrisy, yet no one should be frightened by it. And for this reason, that all Christians are truly of the spiritual estate, and there is among them no difference at all but that of office. Everywhere you go, you're representing Jesus Christ. You are a spiritual holy priesthood, God's own special people. Now, he, he goes on to write, uh, actually, this isn't a sermon, I believe, but Roland Banton records the, the gist of what he's talking about. He's talking about, first of all, he talks about how Mary, when the angel appears to Mary, says, did, what did Mary do after the angel left her? She went back to sweeping the house. She went back to scouring the pots. He says, I don't know that they had pots exactly like that, but She went back to milking the cows. She went back to her ordinary duties. The mother of God, the Virgin Mary. She lived an ordinary life and faithfully fulfilled her duties. And then he talks about the shepherds. He says those shepherds that received this vision from God that uh, Jesus had been born, the shepherds worked. They had had a mean job watching their flocks by night. But after seeing the babe and telling people about it, they went back. That's exactly what the text says. It says, and they returned. Surely that must be wrong, Martin Luther said. We should correct the passage, Martin Luther goes on to say, to read, they went and shaved their heads, fasted, told their rosaries, and put on cows, that's monkhoods. 
Instead, we read the shepherds returned. Where to? To their sheep. And the sheep would have been in a sorry way if they had not. The sheep would have been in a sorry way if they had not. If all I do is read my Bible and pray for 23 and a half hours a day and don't come in contact and sympathize and show compassion for the world around me, I'm misrepresenting what Jesus is all about. Romans 12, 1 says it this way, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. How do you worship? Live your life as a spiritual sacrifice. And then he breaks down what that looks like. And we're going to rush through this. Body of Christ is gifted, verses 3 to 8 says, as being uh, with prophecy, teaching, exhorting, leading, giving, and showing mercy. And then it goes on to break it down further. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. And then it shows what this looks like. A living sacrifice looks like loving without hypocrisy, which is to be kindly affectionate. Put each other first, verse 10. Be diligent and fervent in service, verse 11. Be joyful in hope, verse 12. Be patient in hard times, verse 12 continues. Be faithful in prayer, Share with those in need, verse 13. Practice hospitality, it continues. Bless those who persecute you, verse 14. This is so practical. It's horizontal. It's about our sympathy and compassion for humanity around us. Our vertical relationship has to impact our neighbors. Love, have sympathy and empathy. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, verse 15. This is not just taking the truth and saying, here, have it or leave it and walking off. Do you see that we as a royal priesthood have to come close to people? We have to care about what's going on in their life. We have to sympathize with their needs. We have to mingle among men as Jesus did. Sympathize with their needs. Help them in practical ways before we invite them to follow Jesus. Live in harmony with everyone, verse 16. Goes on to say, be humble and spend time with people in low positions. Don't repay evil for evil, verse 17. Be careful to do what's right in the sight of all men. Keep going here. Live at peace with everyone as long as it depends on you, verse 18. And then it just keeps getting better. Don't take revenge, verse 19. If your enemy is hungry, do something practical for him. Take, take food to him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Overcome evil with good. Be subject to the governing authorities, verses 13, 1 to 5, or chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. Pay taxes. All of these things are a part of our spiritual worship, our living as a sacrifice for Jesus. So friends, I want to encourage you, no matter what your profession is, no matter what you do day in and day out, you are called to be a priest, to show people what Jesus is like where you are at. And whatever you are doing, whether it's cleaning the house, whether it's mowing the lawn, whether it's driving your car, whether it's paying taxes, And then Hebrews chapter 13, the last verse we'll look at, verses 15 and 16 says, Therefore by him, being our high priest, let us continually offer the sacrifice of what? Praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Thanking God for the incredible God that he is, is a sacrifice that we as a priesthood offer to God as a pleasing offering. And then notice the very next words. But do not forget to do good and to share For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. When we do good, when we share with people, those sacrifices, wherever we're at, they change people's perspective of who God is. Last Thursday, I'll just give you one example from my personal life. And I'd love for you to to come and share examples from your life of how this is taking place in your everyday life. But on Thursday mornings, I'm making it a practice to go with Hope and Faith Ministries, which goes out and does a street outreach, but it's really a riverbed outreach on Thursday mornings. And we go down to the riverbed, and as we're going around, we've got burritos, we've got uh, bars for them, we've got meal replacements, we've got a medical kit with us. And we we said, oh, we've got to make sure we get Chris, because most of the people are, are a little bit further north, but Chris is a bit farther south. He's the one that I told about a few weeks ago that he had the matted hair and that they, they were checking his cut to make sure he was okay. 
And so we went down the riverbed to find Chris. And as we're walking up the hill, we're saying, hey, Chris, would you like a burrito today? Chris, are you there? And from out of his tent, we hear, hey, I was, wonder- I was just thinking, are those church people coming again? Chris is a guy who, they said when they first interacted with him, he would just babble. He would talk to the birds. I've seen him talk to rocks and throw rocks and move rocks around. But they said over the time that they've been investing in him, he's beginning to open up. He's beginning to recognize that there's somebody that cares about me. And they're from church. They're Christ followers. That morning, Leah had, well, actually, she'd previously helped me out. She's an excellent uh, declutterer in our house. And I had three backpacks stashed away in my closet, dusty old backpacks that had a few items in them, and I just had them sitting there. So she went through the backpack. She helped me, and she said, okay, what are we going to do with these backpacks? She said, hey, why don't you take those backpacks to the riverbed? I know how much homeless individuals love to have backpacks. And so I took those backpacks around, and I had one last backpack, and I said, Chris, you need a backpack. (laughs) He said, are you serious? (laughs) He lit up. He was so excited, he, he actually grabbed the backpack before he would take any food. And he's like, sorry, I was so distracted when they were trying to hand him food. I was just so excited about this backpack. A really small thing. Something that was insignificant to me. I probably would have taken it to the thrift store or tossed it. It has holes in it. But to do good and to share is a sacrifice that makes a difference for suffering humanity. And this is what we're called to. Not everybody is called to do this in the riverbed, but you're called to do it with your neighbors. You're called to do it at work. You're called to do it with your kids, your grandma, your wife, your husband. Every human being needs your sympathy and needs your affection to open up till you love with more and more of a tender heart. David Asherick says it this way. Come close, as close as you possibly can to the people around you. Build friendships. Love them hard. We need people who build friendships. Just a plug for the farm. We need you to to come up to the farm and make friends with people. (laughs) Invite them to lunch. Don't start off with telling them everything that you think they need to change in their life. I've had to learn that the hard way. I just need to make friends. And as I make friends, I'm able to open up to them and to be able to gently lead them to know Jesus the way that I know him because I actually care about them and I've wept with them, I've rejoiced with them, and I know what they're going through. Thank you to those of you who are doing that. And I challenge you, everywhere you go, love people hard. Build relationships. Invite people over to your house. Take them for a walk. Do whatever it takes to build friendships for Jesus. All the while showing them how beautiful and radically different Jesus is from anyone else they've ever known. The church is called to be distinct, not distant. There is a big difference invite you to open your heart up to the people around you. But first, open your heart to Jesus, who will fill you with a reservoir of grace and mercy that enables you to love the unlovable. And if you need ideas, we're going to try more consistently to give you ideas from the farm to the riverbed to this past week there was a ride needed or there was other opportunities If you text this number, you'll just be made aware of opportunities. Or if you email me and say, I'd like to know about service opportunities, we'll let you know about them. It's a great opportunity. But you've seen them. You've seen people all around you that need your help. They're not just the poorest of the poor. They're the wealthiest. They're the Ann Millers who are ready to shut themselves up from their kids for the rest of their lives because they don't know that God is on their side. That he loves them more than his own existence. I invite you just to bow your heads and just in the silence of your own heart, ask Jesus to reveal to you how he wants to make you a royal priest to the people around you. Father, open our hearts 
wider and wider until they're finally as wide open as your heart, as you willingly gave your life for those who were nailing you to the cross. Thank you for your infinite love. May we fix our eyes on Jesus and recognize that the grace we need comes only from you. And as we do so, may you pour out your righteousness in our hearts so much so that it overflows into the world around us and they can taste and see that you're good, that we become the fragrance of Christ. Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.